We are continuing in Romans. We are going to be starting chapter 5. So our main, um, our main text this morning will be from chapter 5. We are going to start with verses 1 through 5. This is the 25th week of Romans, and the title of this one is Therefore Being Justified. So if you would stand for the reading of the word, please say praise the Lord when you get to Romans 5. While everyone's standing, I also want to echo what Pastor said this morning, is thank you all for coming and working and putting the time and energy to keep in this building looking as good as it looks today. Thank you. So, starting in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Sister Rita, will you pray for our Sunday school lessons? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So one thing I have to constantly remind myself is that there is no breaks in the original Scripture. Because it's very easy to compartmentalize, especially when we have so much going on. We like to put things in buckets and break it and stuff like that. And I appreciate what the translators did because it's a lot easier to try and find the reference material versus saying, turn about 300 pages into Isaiah and we'll start here. So I, I do appreciate what was done, but the problem is, is our mindset silos things, and we start breaking what the train of thought is. We, we lose track of it, and because of that, we often take things out of context, which then is not a good thing because then it's manipulated by our own minds and thinking and thoughts and you know gives us false revelations of who God is. So instead, the breaks are added by the translator, so please excuse some of the words I might use it's not meant to be disrespectful, but it is somewhat of a vernacular. So with that being said, we are starting a new chapter, but we are not starting a new thought whatsoever. In chapter 4, we looked at Abraham and how righteousness was imputed by obedience to what God revealed. And it's summed up simply, therefore, being justified by faith. Me and all my brain power would start with and finish with those words because expanding simple thoughts is difficult for me. I want to break things down, so I want to keep it simple. Simple thoughts. Sorry, that's the blue-collar mentality that shines through. I kind of try and live by the KISS method, and that means keep it simple, stupid. So, therefore, being justified by faith. Again, I'm going to point out faith is the knowledge of the person, plan, and identity of God. So that we can know what he plans to do, and we can act accordingly. And I know that is a chopped up summary of the full, but that's what it is. What he has revealed, so we may know him and be obedient. The Greek is very limited in the words that are available. I actually appreciate it because I find that Greek has less words than I do. So it's simpler than me, and I really enjoy that. But because it's limited, we have to look at what the evidence of the use of words are. And I'm not going to go over it yet again, but we did take a look at the difference between faith and faith active, between faith and obedience, and we looked at the past few weeks in 2 Peter 1, Acts 2, Acts 10, and the prior chapter in Romans. And so we come to the summation there. We are justified by faith. 
And so I wanted to know, what is justification? It is the declaration, the pronouncement of one to be just, righteous, or my favorite, as they ought to be. The problem with that is the justification doesn't always make the person not guilty. I might be justified, but it doesn't mean I'm not guilty. And I'm part of me as I struggle to put to words how I feel. Emotions are a very, they're like a three foreign language down. I think I have a better chance of speaking fluent French right now than to express how I emotionally feel looking at this stuff. So forgive me. And my wife's chuckling in agreement, so you know that's not an exaggeration. It's his sacrifice and responsibility to his creation that advocates to the judge that his creation or his created beings are as they ought to be. I don't know about you, but the feeling that I get, I got, I don't know how to say, glitter in my chest, butterflies. Just that feeling is, I see my shortcomings. Not all of them. I see the glaring ones that bother me. The ones that don't bother me so much, I don't notice as much. Or if I do, I consider that just tools of the trade, you know? Sometimes being a hammer is a very good thing. But for the Creator to sacrifice and declare us as we ought to be. His sacrifice paying for our sins before the judge. And our choice is to accept his mercy and reconciliation and choose him now and demonstrate his goodness and mercy and lordship or to have our name blotted out of the book of life to be judged and in that judgment declare his mercy and his lordship and his sovereignty, and then to be cast out of his presence. He will be declared just. Our choice does not change how we will declare who he is. He will be justified by his creation. His existence will be justified. Creation will declare his glory. His character has been revealed, and creation justifies it. Again, justification is to pronounce one to be just, righteous, and as he ought to be. But here's the difference. We know that justice does not make us right. It declares one right. He calls us to be justified, because he declares what we will be when we are complete in him. I can't put into words the joy I feel of where I am now. And he says, you are mine. He is at his, as he ought to be. I don't feel anything like I ought to be. I've said it in the past week. I've had emotions and just angry about stuff for no reason that I can justify. No good reason. And I can't point to it. And I know that I shouldn't feel that way because it's not appropriate for my relationship between God and myself and myself and others. And I want it to be removed but I don't have the capability of removing that, that emotion. I can choose how I act, but come face to face with that shortcoming and wanting to rip it out, but can't. 
the frustration, I don't know about you, but the frustration that brings of wanting to remove that diseased part but not being able to. I don't know about you, but having the back fused, I have some chronic pain. I would love to rip that part out. Not because I want to miss the part, because I want to get rid of that chronic pain. I don't want it. I don't want to live with it. And to put that spiritually, do we have that in us? I want to rip it out because of that enmity that it puts, that improperness in my life. And yet, we are justified by faith. He declares, he calls us justified because he declares what we will be when we complete in him. He calls us what we will be. He is just. He is 1% absolutely unchangeable, sovereign, and eternal. He cannot change. He cannot deny who he is. And we will see him as he is, and we will declare it. I don't have the words to emphasize, but it's not about us. It's about him, our seeing and declaring him. It is about him. And this does not diminish him one bit. Instead, it emphasizes that he is love. Creation sees the demonstration of who he is. Creation does not dictate and define him. And thinking about the magnitude of the Creator, I couldn't help but think about one of the passages that our pastor had talked about uh, in the Jesus Is series that he was preaching. In Revelations 5, it says, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within, and on a backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loosen the seven seals thereof. Our conquering God can come open this book. He's going to come, the conqueror, the sovereign one, the almighty God. And I beheld him, lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb. As it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits, sent forth into all the earth. And he came, the lamb, the savior. He came, and he took the book out of the right hand that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, golden vials full of orders, which are in the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation." And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beats and the elders. And a number of them was ten thousand times ten thousands, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the King, the Root of King David, the majestic and powerful one, the conquering King who prevailed to open the book. Yet, and we do not deserve it. There is nothing deserving of it. It is because of who He is. 
Yeah, it is the Lamb, the sacrificed one, the Savior who opens the book over and over. He is the Almighty God with majesty and every right to make demands and declare, and He has declared Himself the Savior. Truly, He is love. The Lion of the tribe of Judah is that Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He is the one who justifies us through the knowledge of Him and permanence through obedience to His declaration. All of this is contained in therefore being justified by faith. The Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is by who we are justified and how we have peace with God. And peace. Oh, what a concept. If man was actually capable of it in and of themselves. But we are not. We are warring. We want more. And if we can't get it, we will take it. And if taking leads to war, so be it. As long as I get what I want. But peace is the lack of war. The lack of strife. The lack of contention. If justification leads to peace, lack of justification means there is no peace or there is conflict. And without the Savior, there was conflict because we had fallen out of what we ought to have been. There was conflict with us in creation. God didn't change. He did not change in any of this. We changed. In order to be restored back to a peace, it required the Savior's justification of us. And that peace is through Jesus Christ. It says, by whom also we have access. The Hebrew here for access by faith, by Him, our Lord Jesus Christ, also means we can approach Him. Mm -hmm. How glorious is that? It's not just access, but the connotation it brings to mind is you can approach unto the King. You don't just walk into the King's quarters. You go to, was it, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue? You're not just walking in and saying hello. Oh, you might be able to sign up for a guest tour, but you're not getting to see the president. And that's a elected person. You're not going to go to England and just waltz in and see, hey, King Charles, what's happening? Let's do lunch sometime. Matter of fact, I was, I forget if it was YouTube or whatnot, but there is like a two-hour class that you have to have for etiquette before you even greet I'm not even talking having a meal. Just stand there and greet royalty. There's a two-hour class about the proper way to stand, to look, to move, the whole nine yards. We don't have that. I don't know about you, but if I'm at work and my boss says, I want to see in my office, it's immediately, what did I do wrong? I don't want to go in there. And I'm a lot closer to my boss than I am to any official. But we just don't go waltzing into the king's presence. You don't go unless you're called. We have the story of Esther who says, listen, I'm his wife, but you need to pray because if he says, what are you doing or it's wrong, I'm dead. It is severe. There is no access, but he is the access to approach unto God. John 6, 65 says, And he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And through him we can stand in his grace. Galatians 5, 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Standing 
fast in him and his grace means we are out of the yoke of bondage. We are not entangled with that. And we're all familiar with Ephesians 6 and armor of God, but it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye can fight whatever you want. That you can be my army and you can march and you can, you can do this and you can do that and you'll be able to take on the world. You'll get superpower. I wish that was it. We are called to stand. Put on the whole armor of God that ye be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Standing is to be ready to guard. Standing means you're not entangled. I have been very tired doing HVAC. I've yet to fall asleep standing up and stay standing. I know it's possible. I've heard stories of it. But most people aren't going to stay standing. They're going to be lounging against something. Standing means to be ready, to be free, to be able to move. To have sure footing. I don't know if anybody has ever done any self-defense training. It's fun standing up. You know what's not fun? Practicing self-defense from a sitting position. Because you are vulnerable. You're more vulnerable sitting down. Someone's standing over you. You are already prone. We're not called to be lazy and sit. We're called to stand. To be ready. Not only to stand, but to put on Christ. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That word rejoice is our boast. I mean, we, we have to boast in him. That's, that's who we say, look, this is him. It says, men, don't glory in your stuff. Don't glory in your might. Don't glory in your wisdom. But glory in God. He goes, we should boast in our hope of the glory of God. Our earnest expectation of Him. We glory in the expectation of His majesty. Acts 7.55 says, But he being full of the Holy Ghost, and it's talking about Stephen, looking up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, even Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens open, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We are justified by our obedience to the revelation of God, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the glory of God, by whom we can approach unto his grace, and putting on Christ we can stand. And that is our earnest expectation, that he is faithful, that he is just, and he is who he has revealed himself. And then... Paul goes into three, verse three here. I kind of like the first one because the first one talks about the benefits, the goal, being justified, being who we will be. I understand tribulations are necessary, but it says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Really? I got a glory in tribulations? Yeah, I guess. We have a lot of inspirational quotes, don't we? It's not the destination, it's the journey we should enjoy. I can't tell you the last time a tribulation has shown up and I said, Woo! Exciting! Good stuff! Yeah, right? The only thing I can liken this to is an athlete. Athletes punish their body to break it down in order to succeed 
at their athletic endeavor. For example, if you want to lift very heavy things, you got to start by lifting lighter things and then increasing the weight until you can get to that maximum heavy that you can. Wow, that's pretty simple. It is. It is simple. Keep lifting heavier stuff, and then eventually you'll lift heavier stuff, and eventually you'll lift heavier stuff. But the thing about it is, it's great. Wow, that person can lift a car. I, I know that can be exaggeration, but there are people who can. But how did they get there? By spending hours ripping apart their muscles. By repeating lifting, they actually rip apart their muscles, they tear their body, they cause it to shred, and the body fixes itself. More dense, stronger. It increases in size, it increases in capability, because our bodies adapt. Some better than others. I'd like to think I'm adapted to the cold, but those who do that kind of stuff, their bodies get stronger. But the process to do it is painful. Anybody ever said, oh, you know what sounds like a fun thing to do? Let's do squats. Let's do a squat challenge. We're going to do 30 days of 50 a day. Yeah, that first day, okay, I'm a little sore. That's fine. The second day when you're crawling to the bathroom because you can't walk, ow. Now, what kind of sadist says, I really enjoyed the first two days. Let's keep going. The people who see the results of what those 30 days would bring. You don't maybe not enjoy the process right away, but when you get the results of the process and realize what that development can do, it could be anything. Running. There's a program out there called Couch to 5K. And it's supposed to get you ready to run 5K in like 60 days. I don't like running. Unless a bear's chasing me, I have no intention of running. I bought a car as soon as I could to avoid this. But the point is, is it's small steps that when you look back over time, there is a wide benefit. And when you start seeing the benefit of it, you start enjoying the endeavor. If you stick with lifting weights long enough, it still might be, oh, I can't believe I'm going to do it. You look forward to it, not because of the activity, in some cases, sure, but that's not it. It's I look forward to the gain that I'm going to get from it. I look forward to the benefit that I get from it. I look forward to the health benefits. I look forward to whatever. You can name your benefit. Same thing with our spiritual life. We can go into it and say, I can't believe I'm in this situation. Or we can say, "Is Lord, I am in this situation. What am I missing? When we keep ending up in the same circumstances, I don't believe in coincidence that much. You, meaning me, are the common denominator. Your circumstances are there because of you. Just the probability and law of large numbers says, if the same thing keeps happening over and over and over again, you're probably the reason. And we could take the opportunity to complain about it and end up in the groundhog day of crisis, or to realize there is something that needs to change in me. That's what tribulation is there for, is to bring us face to face with things that we need to change to continue to have a better relationship with him, to bring us to a place where he wants us to be. We think of armor as just, oh, I can strap on some armor, tighten some loops, I can put on Christ. You know what? There's things that are going to have to be chiseled out. There's things that are going to have to be broken up. It's not a one-time, oh, this looks super fun. There is a lot of work that goes into it. And that tribulation is, does that work? 
It breaks down those things. It brings us face to face with those things that we don't want to see. And we glory in that, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. And patience we have looked at before, but is the proper response to people and events that irritate and offend you. Tribulation gives us the opportunity to see things in our life from his perspective. From things that need to be removed from our lives to continue to have proper relationship with him and others. It reveals things that separate us from him. It is an opportunity to allow him to change us. And that patience worketh experience. It is not without troubles that we don't learn to overcome. When we overcome those, it becomes a learning experience. It's something that becomes our, I guess, our bag of tricks, our tool bag. We all have different things that we picked up. Different tricks. Now, I know, I have a very limited bag here, but for uh, HVAC, for example, there are a countless amount of fittings to go from a two-inch pipe to a one-inch pipe. The inexperienced person would say, I need 57 fittings. I need everything from two inch to one and a half. I need two to one and three quarter. I need two to one. I need two to three quarters. I need two to half. I need everything in between. I need everything on my truck as you can get it as quickly as possible in case I can run into it. The experienced technician says, no, I just need one two to one and a half, a one and a half to one. That's all I need. I can make it work with what I was given. There are adequate things. I don't need to fill my truck with junk. We think of different tricks. One of the best ones I've heard was if you have a pipe that's leaking water while you're trying to solder it. One old school trick is you take a piece of white bread, roll it up tight, push it in a pipe, solder it. The water's going to break it down, open the valve, it flushes out, close it. But that water absorbs. It pulls that water away. It's a trick. Now there's this new fancy doodad that you put in the pipe and you put your ratchet on and you tighten it up and it creates all, all kinds of stuff because that trick was really good, so now can I profit off of it? But there are different things that each one of us in our life have learned to do. There are certain things that, you know, maybe using the right tool for the job. Another example I personally love is the new drills have a little magnetic thing on the base that you can put the screws on. Because, oh, you know, doing it over and over again and losing my screws and not being able to find it, or watching Jonathan under the pew yesterday trying to tighten things down, reaching all over the place for a screw, instead I can have it on a drill because, hey, I learned from the experience that this makes more sense to Put a little piece of magnet on here. But what about our walk with God? Because sometimes we'll run into similar circumstances that we've been in before. And do we want to panic again? Sometimes. Or we can say, I've been here before. I know who God is. I know who my deliverance is. I know that I can't get myself out of the circumstance. I know that I am reliant upon Him. And that is the experience that causes hope. We see it multiple times, and we know what the expected end is. We know where the deliverance comes from. But we don't, come on, we don't go to that place of reliance upon God easily. Because we look at ourselves first. It says, because the love of God is shed abroad, in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. That shed abroad means literally gushes out, spills in our hearts, the center of our beings. Tribulation is an opportunity to see our shortcomings and be changed, and that process gives us the earnest expectation of the goodness of God in our lives 
that brings out his character in us. And that is how we can glory in the tribulation. It's too often we want to give up. Because if we look at ourselves, we know we can't. But we have merciful doesn't do it justice. Holy doesn't do him justice. Love doesn't do him justice. But that's as big as our brains can think. It doesn't matter how many varies you put in front of it. Our brains are like, yeah, we, we know we got to say very because we can't put the right words on it. But he is a merciful and just God. And knowing that he is not going to leave us in tribulations. And knowing that he is not going to leave us forsaken. And knowing that he's not going to leave us in dire circumstances. Because we have hope. That earnest expectation that whatever we come across in our lives, it will work to his good. And if we are in his hands, regardless of how we feel about it, we will be better off than left to our own devices. There was a game I used to love playing at my uncle's house on a computer called Lemmings. And very simple. There was a box, little characters dropped out of, and there was a goal that you had to get them to. The problem is the goal was typically opposite of a cliff that they would jump off of. And they would just drop out and they would just walk. And the whole thing is you had to take control of one to say, stop, don't jump off a cliff, go the other way. All too often, we are the lemmings. Left to our own devices, we're like, oh, there's a cliff. Let me just keep going to it. Sorry, camera people. I'm just off to the left. And we just think, hey, this is a great idea. I, this is wonderful. Whee! And then you're done. I love that game. Because I'm like, ha, they're so dumb. <laughs> if the shoe fits, what can I say? I am a lemming. Left to my own devices, I will destroy myself. But I have a surety that if I put myself in his hands, he will bring me to good. He will justify me by my obedience to him. That he calls me as what I will be when his work is complete. And we can glory not just in him in the end result, but we can glory in the circumstances in our lives that bring us closer to him. Pastor, will you pray a close for us?